Hi, I'm Jalen Rose, and welcome to the Renaissance Man podcast, proudly presented by the New York Post, a show where we cover trends in fashion, entertainment, current events, and everything in between. This week's episode is like a good old-fashioned barbecue in the 313, because my next guest is family. You may know her because she's a journalist for The Atlantic, worked at ESPN. She's a host. She's one of the most respected voices in sports and entertainment. She's also the host of the very popular Spotify exclusive podcast, Jamel Hill is Unbothered. Her new memoir, Uphill, I Have a Copy, is out right now. And in it, she talks about her career, her life growing up in Detroit and breaking her family cycles of intergenerational trauma. It is my honor to welcome the talented Jamel Hill to the show. (laughs) What up though? What up though? Thank you for such a warm, wonderful um, welcome. It must be the good timing award on my part because of course I'm on with you now, Jalen, a couple days after your alma mater just absolutely kicked mine <laughs> yes yes we caught the beat down we caught one like no yes. question yes we gonna we gonna we gonna talk about that and as i mentioned i love you i appreciate you i'm so grateful for all that you do for yourself that you do for the city and i'm gonna ask questions that you know i know the answer to but i gotta <laughs> I ask the questions for people who are just getting to know you for the first time so I want to start off by saying your memoir, congratulations, is out right now. And it talks a lot about growing up in our hometown of Detroit and being on welfare by your, with your single mom who struggled with substance abuse. Give me a snapshot of what that was like for you as a child. Well, and I like to think anybody who's kind of been in a similar situation, they can relate to some of this. But, you know, among the difficult parts about navigating uh, your parents' substance abuse. Um, Because both my parents are recovering addicts. It's just that my father got cleaner much um, uh, earlier than my mother. They weren't together. And when he was going through his struggles, he was kind of in and out. And so we were a bit estranged. And my mother's drug abuse was very much engineered and stoked by the fact that she was a sexual abuse survivor. She was molested as a child from ages four to 11. She suffered a violent rape um, when I was five or six years old. And all of that, um, she had a failing marriage as well that was mixed in there. And all of that um, really drove her to self-medicate. And for me, it was not easy to understand. And it wasn't until we moved to Joy Road. I lived on Joy Road in Lauder um, on the city's west side. And, you know, not a great... (laughs) not a great neighborhood at all and particularly not that apartment complex that we lived in um which you know was very um you know i mean it was it was just dangerous i mean you know how the city was but the thing is as you know Jalen, is that when you grow up in that you don't even realize how dangerous it is correct yes yes you leave and you're just like oh that was really not normal Mm -hmm. so of course you you know this is the the start of the crack era okay and so we're talking about the mid 80s and one particular incident that i write about in the book when you're asking me a snapshot i'll use this as an example but the woman next door who lived next door to us in this apartment got murdered Mm. and my mother was already suffering from a very severe form of ptsd that was brought on by the the violent rape that she suffered Mm. and of course then nobody knew about what PTSD was. People weren't using those terms. And you know, mental health had like a huge stigma in our community. And, you know, growing up on welfare, um, being on and off welfare, we didn't have access to those services anyway, Mm -hmm. uh, even regardless of the stigma. So my mother was very fearful, even though she was raped thousands of miles away in Houston, Texas, that she had this very real fear that her rapist would one day find her. And if not that particular rapist, it would be somebody else. And she had been abused so much in her life. And so when this mother, or so when this woman that's next door to us, our our neighbor gets murdered, it triggered so much. My mother, her drug of choice was always 
painkillers. But on this particular um, night, when after finding that out, my mother decided to smoke some crack. Mm. And she, what she did was she showed me what the crack looked like before she smoked it. I never saw her smoke it, but mm. she showed it to me and told me at that moment that she never wanted me to have any involvement with it. She wanted me to know what it looked like so that if anyone ever approached me with it, then I would know to say no. Now, I know that might sound like a very bizarre and also counterproductive argument, but it obviously is staying in my mind. I was never tempted to do anything mm -hmm. um, that serious, but she was one of those parents, and maybe this is generational and, and real old school, that definitely had the mentality of do as I say, not as I do. Not as I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so... Um, you know, when you see somebody going through that trauma, the night terrors my mother would have and other things or just me in general, not knowing what mood she was going to be in, not knowing what I was going to come home to sometimes from school or when she would pick me up from practice when I was playing softball or something else. It's just a lot because you feel like you're, you're scared all the time and you're also walking on eggshells as well. So, um, you know, because of that, I think, um, I learned to hold a lot of stuff in because I felt like I had to be strong and resilient. And sometimes I had to be the adult. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think as a re I picked up a lot of responses that were ingrained in me that I've been trying to lose as an adult, you know, for many, many years. So it, it certainly wasn't easy, but it was a very complicated situation to grow up in because uh, despite all those circumstances, my mother and my grandmother, um, all the adults that were central parts that, that played central roles in my life, regardless of what shape they were in or what circumstances we were facing, they never let me use that as an excuse not to go to school, not to get good grades, not to take care of my responsibilities. They wanted better for me. And I think because of that, that's the reason I wanted better for myself. Wow. Oh, man. <clears throat> I respect and admire you so much. I have so many follow up questions. Um, one of the things you mentioned as it related to growing up on Joy Road and Lauder is that you didn't realize the danger that was always around us. And there's something that I always talk about young people losing their innocence early. It's almost like I'm in eighth grade, somebody doing crack, somebody smoking weed. We watch it. Scarface. Like I, I don't really get a chance to have a childhood. And in your case, you also needed to do, I guess, what's called reverse parenting, parenting in a lot of ways. So how were you able to navigate that? Well, thank God for grandparents. Thank God for grandma, for big mama, as, as we yeah. like to say. Yeah. And my grandmother, though she, you know, she had some alcohol issues herself she was dealing with. She was also somebody who I was very close to. And so when my mother, um, you know, my, my mother was going through something or maybe even at times where she might have been on a binge. My grandmother was there to pick up the slack mm -hmm. and, you know, pick me up from school. Um, I, I never I, I, and I, I don't say this to boast or brag, I, even though it may sound, again, kind of weird to other people. As bad as my situation was, I, I definitely went to school with people whose situation was way worse, mm -hmm. where they had mothers yeah. who were strung out leaving them for three or four days alone at the time. Mm -hmm. That was never my reality. Right. Neither was having the light shut off, no heat. Mm -hmm. Like I never had to go through right. any of that. I was always well cared for. I was always mm -hmm. fed, clothed, mm -hmm. bathed. Mm -hmm. All the basic necessities were taken care of. Now we couldn't afford to indulge or to splurge on things, mm -hmm. but generally all my basic needs were met. And my grandmother was there to pick up uh, a lot of the slack with her. I did feel like I could mostly be a kid because uh, that's just how grandparents are. You know, like we go to Farmer Jack's. I know you remember Farmer Jack's. <laughs> yes. And the free samples. <laughs> and the free samples, all right? So we go to Farmer Jack's or, you know, we just hit the neighborhood supermarket or whatever. And, you know, I could throw whatever I wanted to in the cart because that's just what grandmas do. And that's awesome. uh, I was really grateful that she was, somebody who was there in my life to be a steadying force, even though her and my mother had a very complicated dynamic as well. When did you realize journalism <laughs> in sports was not only going to be something that you fell in love with, but something that you can make a life and career out of? 
I was very blessed because I figured this out in 10th grade. And the what led to it was kind of a culmination of things. One, I loved to read and had already always been a voracious reader. The other thing was back in those times, because I'm old, <laughs> is that <laughs> you had to, you know, you had to read the newspaper to actually keep up with your sports teams. Correct. And because I always had this natural gravitation to sports, you know, people ask me, well, when did you begin to love sports? I don't remember because I always have. Like, mm -hmm. I don't remember a time anybody having to convince me to, mm -hmm. to try sports or to look mm -hmm. at sports. I was like, I always wanted to. And so growing up in the hood as the neighborhood tomboy and um, really loving to watch sports and also play them, um, reading the newspaper and reading the sports section kind of stoked some curiosity where I got to ask the question, like, wow, people actually write about sports, okay, mm -hmm. for a living. And at the at the, the Detroit Public High Schools at that time, and it was that way also when you were going to Southwestern, if you remember, all of our high school newspapers were actually inserted inside the free press once a month. Mm -hmm. And you had to go down to the newspaper, the actual professional paper, the free press, in order to put your paper together. By uh, in 10th grade, I joined my high school newspaper staff. So once a month, mm -hmm. I had to go down to the Detroit Free Press. It was like, you know, a really good, awesome, cool field trip because you get to go downtown. <laughs> and uh, the first time I walked into the newsroom, I knew this was the place that I wanted to be. I loved writing. As I said, I love sports. And the newsroom just had this energy and this rhythm I just really wanted to be a part of. So I applied for a high school apprenticeship program that the Free Press ran for Detroit area high school students. I got into the program and for six weeks at $10 an hour, 20 hours a week, um, I learned about what it takes to be a journalist, how to write a story, how to interview people, how to build a resume. I was assigned to mentors who I'm still friends with to this day. And that was such a huge turning point for me in my life. I know we talk all the time about mentorship and programs. Mm -hmm. And when you see these programs and you know this better than anybody given uh, what you've been able to do with the Jalen Rose Academy in, in school, the exposure or in Detroit, the exposure that you can give young people at an early age can really change their life. And that program was life changing for me in coordination with another very big event uh, that intersected with it at the same time. This summer I was a, a free press apprentice. The National Association of Black Journalists Convention was in Detroit. And the woman who ran uh, the apprenticeship program, uh, a black woman, she made all of us go to the NABJ convention, pass out our resumes, and they were super thin. You know, most people had like fast food experience. I, I think I had worked, uh, because my grandmother was a social worker, I had worked in a welfare office filing cases. I had paper cuts wow. for days, wow. right? And so uh, paper cuts ain't no joke, man. I, I hate filing to this day <laughs> because of that. <laughs> so uh, we go down to the convention, which is at Cobo Hall. And I, we, she told us that every person she pointed out that we had to walk up to them and introduce ourselves and say we wanted to be journalists and hand them our resume. So I had to go up to a bunch of strangers I didn't know and say, hi, my name is Jamel Hill. I'm a rising junior at Muffer High School and I want to be a journalist. Here's my resume. And what she was trying to do is get us to have a real understanding about what it took to be a success, um, about how prepared that we had to be. And especially because we were black and from Detroit, mm -hmm. the expectations and the scrutiny was going to be different because you know how people view our city and have viewed it mm -hmm. for a long time. People don't expect good things to come out of Detroit. Right. And so we had to do everything possible to defy that stereotype about what being what people from Detroit were like. Absolutely. And that's what I was doing as an athlete because I never wanted to be considered a dumb jock. So I used to go out of my way to try to make sure I was on an honor roll and a good student. And even though I left after my junior year, I went back to get my degree because of the same thing that we always know that we can't leave a stone unturned. We got to always continue to prove ourselves. But I want to ask you something about women in sports. One of the dumbest things I hear athletes say is when they feel the only people who can chastise them are the people who accomplished more than they did. Like that's, <laughs> that's the dumbest thing of all time. All you need to do is be informed and knowledgeable about a topic before you really speak on it. So being a woman, a black woman in sports, 
how was it for you early when you realized that I have to earn the respect of not only the fans and the people that I work with, but also the players? So for my career, the athletes never gave me any trouble. Uh, I never got a sense from them that they didn't respect me. They may not have been always totally accustomed to having a black woman cover them, but they never really gave me any of that energy of you don't belong. Now, ESPN is a little different vehicle because it's such a massive platform. And anytime you criticize an athlete in that realm, it's going to hit like a, a, mm-hmm. a, a thunderous boom, you right. know, <laughs> right. And so I've certainly seen this happen to a lot of my, you know, colleagues and friends like Carrie Champion. I, I remember mm-hmm. Durant came after her because of something she said about him. Um, and uh, so did Damian Lillard responded to her criticism. So s- certainly we see numerous examples of when women say something or we exhibit the same confident opinion that men do, then we're told to go back to the kitchen. Or in my case, as I used to be told, not necessarily from athletes, but from fans and viewers and readers, which would be either to go back to the kitchen, go right for Cosmo or go back to Africa. Mm-hmm. One of those three, or if not a combination. And I think what it is, is that, you know, as obviously being in a male dominated sport or a male dominated profession, it's, it's different because most women are kind of in male dominated professions, but sports is like a male, male dominated literally. profession. Yeah, literally. It's like very, you know, and so I, I think what I, I never wanted an athlete or a coach to say that about me, that I wasn't prepared, that I didn't know what I was talking about. And I think the way I kind of broke that down is that I never approached them like I knew more than them. And you know this, Jalen, as an athlete, a lot of reporters do that. Correct. And I don't care if you talking to somebody who averaged two points a game and that's it. Or if you're talking to somebody who riding the oak and especially if they're a professional, honestly, I really, even if they're in college, that person knows more than you about the game because they've been playing it. That does not mean that you don't see very obvious things that are wrong with either how they're playing or wrong with the scheme being built around them that you don't recognize these things. But I never wanted to come off as that know-it-all. In fact, I tell younger journalists all the time, don't be afraid to ask questions, even if it seems dumb, because Mm -hmm. I promise you, especially if you're in a group of reporters, other reporters don't know that either. The same thing. They think of the same thing. They don't know the same thing. Like, you know, yes, I can identify a bunch of coverages in defensive coverages in the NFL or, you know, in football in general. I don't know as much as Bill Belichick and I don't know as much as, <laughs> like, I, I, I just don't. Like, it's so, right. it's, it's no shame in admitting what you don't know. Our job is to explain why it happened, give you some context, um, some research, some facts, a whole bunch of things that go into creating a story and creating a a narrative. And so I think some of it is that as journalists, it's our job to not be so arrogant about the spaces Mm -hmm. that we're in. But on the other side of it, I think uh, the viewing public or even some athletes themselves have to understand what you know about the game and sports is not at all related to your genitalia. Those are not. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, as you know, the majority of, of sports writers do not know, have not played And there are even some coaches that haven't played before either, right? Or haven't played at a high level. You know, Bill Belichick never, I don't, I'm pretty sure Bill Belichick never played in the NFL. And he's probably the greatest coach in modern NFL history. You know, Jeff Van Gundy, who we listen to on a regular basis. I mean, he never played in the NBA and he's a great coach. So those things are, are, are not relatable, but yes, as a woman, you know, you're going to be scrutinized more. You know that if you make a even an innocent mistake, you know, there were times when I was doing Sports Center or doing his and hers with Mike. And if I flubbed mm-hmm. the name, it was that's why women don't belong. If Mike right. does it, it's just like, oh, he's just he just made a mistake. So there right. you know that there are different standards and they're not fair. And the best thing you can do is to be as prepared as possible so that you don't give people the room to say that about you. Shout Mike, shout Carrie. And here's the thing I want to make sure I stress. hearing you say that reminds me of the times when athletes that played a sport, the public only expected them to talk about that sport. Yes. You have gone through that big time. (laughs) Yes. So I could be on with Greeny and he could talk about basketball, football, whatever. But then when I want to talk about baseball, I was like, Oh, what what is he doing? Talking about something. He didn't play baseball. 
and, and, and that goes towards exactly what you're saying about, you know, earning our keep and taking our respect. But I, I want to ask you something that I don't get a chance to hear you speak enough about. Some of the things you did for fun <laughs> growing up in Detroit. Oh, what is man. The you personally did for fun. You know, Jalen, we had that good, that good, wholesome, clean fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, not always, though, because I do, you know, I ain't going to lie. I done played hide and go get it before. I'm yep. not going to lie. Hide go seek, hide go get them, 7 Eleven. <laughs> All of that. I, I have survived the giant slide. It wasn't giving people concussions when we yeah, was on exactly. it. <laughs> you see I was that. like, I survived that just fine. Um, and, you know, of course, freeze tag in the streets. Yes. We used to, um, when I lived, I used to live on Seven Mile in Asbury Park, mm -hmm. and we uh, we would put old mattresses, um, you know, at the bottom of, of the garage, get on top of the garage, and do flips off of them. No, yep. no doubt. <laughs> I was like, yeah, no I doubt. Was like, hood yeah. acrobats. Hood acrobats, right? All we day, doing, all we day. Hood, hood gymnastics. What about Northland? What about oh. wheels? Northland wheels. Going to actual Northland Mall. You know, mm -hmm. walk around there for yes. hours. Um, I don't know if it was this way for you, but uh, growing up, like we we boycotted Fairlane Mall. We did not. I did not. I remember that actually. That yeah. was that that was after the years I was going there. It's funny, yeah. and, and, and you were always somebody that was conscious of doing what you could to help things better in your community. So, a young Jamel, how do you get a group of people that you're with? to ban going to Fairlane at the time? So one, I didn't want to cross my grandmother. That's number one, <laughs> okay. So not only, you know, I guess to give people a little backstory, but there was a lot of racially, like racial profile incidents that happened at, at, at Fairlane that in were Dearborn, very public. Yep. In Dearborn, And uh, because of that, a lot of black people didn't feel welcome there, didn't feel comfortable. So we said, screw it, we're not spending our money there. My grandmother, um, also had an incident at, at Fairlane where they wouldn't accept a check, to, check of hers. Now, this is an older Black woman. She got the ID. She got everything they said she needed, and they still wouldn't take the check. And she felt like she was being racially profiled. So we didn't go back. I didn't go back to Fairlane for years, wow. you know, because of that. It wasn't until yeah. maybe I was an adult and they had mm -hmm. addressed some of the issues and just it changed. And so a lot of times, as you know, Jayla, the consciousness starts in your own family. You know, mm -hmm. my mother... She grew up in, in Detroit in, in the 50s and, and 60s, and she ate at the Black Panthers free breakfast program. Mm. My grandmother was always very outspoken. She, My mother was always very outspoken. A, a lot of the people in my family, like, you know, they were in the, you know, in the union. And so you already know that mm -hmm. when you're part of something like um, an auto union, there's a one band, one sound mentality. Like we, we all we got CMB, uh -huh. right? Yep. And so I was raised with that sense of community, that sense of justice and injustice and understanding what that looked like. And I think growing up in Detroit and seeing how we were just portrayed so negatively all mm -hmm. the time, Literally. it just made me that much more vigilant about telling the full story about our city. Yes, we have had urban blight. Sure, when I was growing up there, and I think it was the same for you, Detroit had over a million people and we see what the mm -hmm. population is like now. Um, we understand what the drug trade and the crack epidemic did to our city, much like it did a lot of cities. Mm -hmm. But the way that we love our city, like, don't nobody put on for Detroit like we put on for Detroit. Nobody. Correct. Correct. And there's a sense of community and toughness and shared toughness in that that I just wouldn't want to have been from any other place. You Because, like, you see somebody with a Detroit hat, it's different than a Yankee cap or a Dodgers cap. They really from there or know somebody from there if oh, they were wearing that cap. Yeah, I mean, that's what I love about it. Um, it one of the rare instances of this wasn't a case was recently, it was, uh, I was, when me and my husband, um, mm -hmm. your fellow Southwestern. South, Southwest, <laughs> what up though, Ian? <laughs> yeah, a fellow uh, Southwestern uh, schoolmate. Um, mm -hmm. he, we were on the Tamara Hall show and it was one of the uh, production um, folks had on a, a, a English D. And we both saw, we like, you from the D? Like, what? And of course, you know, we admitted, like, what's that? Right. You, you must to? be from the D. Yes, because who else does that? It turned out 
He was not. His first name started with a D and he liked the Gosh. look of the old English D. And I was like, I tell you, that's the first time that has ever happened yep. to me. Yeah, that's never with happened. that English D, not named Ice Cube, are usually from Detroit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you know what? So Sunday, Jamil, I was at a football game rocking my Beverly Hills cop, Jerry Bruckheimer produced Detroit Lions classic vintage jacket. And I thought about this interview I was about to do with you, and it reminded me of something. How did you avoid being in an abusive relationship with the Lions? <laughs> How did you avoid you know, this? You know, uh, just seeing what you go through, seeing what my <laughs> husband goes through, you know, seeing members of my family. I, I pray for y'all. I'm like, <laughs> Lord, deliver them. Can they, I mean, please do, because they don't deserve this awful football for generations. Y'all have put a generational fan curse like, it's just, it's so bad. And I avoided it because like a lot of kids, you're attracted to winning. And, and this is how I can understand. Yep. I remember when um, LeBron James, like I think in his teenage years, and he talked about the teams he was a fan of, and he named yeah. like all the popular Yankees, teams. Like, Cowboys, Yankees, Cowboys, Alabama football. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he named all of them. And I was like, I get it, man. I get it. You see them win, you get on the bandwagon. And that's what it was. In my case, my mother, uh, moved to Oakland when she was uh, just out of high school with my father. And she really liked the 49ers. She loved Joe Montana. She thought he was, as she used to put it, the coolest white boy on earth. No, and not. I started watching the 49ers. And then, you know, this is um, late 70s, early 80s Alliance. I mean, they they were, re I mean, I can't say they were as bad. They were similarly bad, okay? Right. Not very good. <laughs> And I'm like, why would I watch this team she, of the eights? And, you know, she she still with Rupert Lions. I didn't even bother. I picked up every Detroit team. And I was lucky because the Tigers won when I was nine. Yep, the, the bad boys and the Pist 84, the Pistons, yep. they started their trajectory. I remember mm -hmm. when they drafted Isaiah. Yep. They started their trajectory in the late 80s. The Wings got a star named Steve mm -hmm. Eiserman. Yes, you know, indeed. all of this happened at once. So I had plenty of reasons to root for the other Detroit teams. Right. <laughs> I just did not have a compelling one to root for the Lions. I do not root against them because, again, for the mental well-being of my <laughs> husband, of you, I Thank want this you. team to do well. But, Thank man, I don't know how y'all do it. I really don't. I don't that, know how y'all do that's it. That's why I said it's an abusive relationship. So I have to... Again, congratulate you for your new memoir. Uphill is out right now. And it prompts me to ask you this question. Your five favorite books. That is such a great question, Jalen. I appreciate that. Okay. So my favorite book of all time is Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, I'm going to also put Invisible Man in there by uh, Ralph Ellison, a fan a phenomenal book. I'm trying to like maybe go into some different genres. Um, one of the best books that I've read recently is a book called Night Crawling by a wonderful young author out of Oakland named, uh, I believe her name was, is, is Leela Mosley. I think that's her name. And this book is sensational. I finished it in like three days. Maybe the best memoir I think I've ever read is Viola Davis's, which mm -hmm. is out now. And that is, it's something, it just stops you in your track. And maybe the best historical fiction uh, book I've ever read is a book called um, Home Going by a, a young author named Ya Jesse. And it really is meaningful for me because um, I went to Ghana last year. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and this historical fiction is, it traces the transatlantic slave trade into America through starts in Ghana and it, it traces the, this one family that split up because of the, of the transatlantic slave trade. And it's really wonderful. But as you see from my library behind me, like books are everything. I think mm -hmm. books are the way that you take a trip without going to the airport. Mm -hmm. It's the way you um, wind up learning about people without having actually physically met those people. Mm -hmm. Books give us curiosity and learning, critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it breaks my heart when I read about this very disingenuous movement to ban some of the greatest literature of our time, a lot of which is by authors of color. And thank you for breaking the stereotype because you heard the term 
if you want to hide something from a black person, put it in a book. Put it in a book, yeah. That, that was said for years. Yeah, I mean, and it's, um, and honestly, the the worst part about that being repeated over and over again is that pretty soon people start to believe it, as in the people they're talking about start mm-hmm. to believe it. Um, and the book publishing industry believes it. Mm-hmm. And uh, one thing that has been a real education uh, as I've gone through this process of writing my own memoir is that, you know, not necessarily with my own book publishing company, but the difficult terrain that it is for Black authors and the difficult terrain for Black-owned bookstores. So mm-hmm. I've encouraged everybody who, if you're interested in buying a copy of Appeal, which I hope you are, um, mm-hmm. yes, it's available at Amazon and wherever books are sold, but be intentional about ordering this book from a black bookstore. A lot of them were hit very hard in the pandemic. And I've definitely tried to tweet out their links whenever people have asked me where they have gotten the book. So you're on your book tour, the final stop. I'll be there graciously. Thank you for the invite. I wouldn't miss it for anything. It's gonna be at the Detroit Public Library. Why was it so important for you to have Detroit as the last stop and for you to do it there? It's my home and it has my heart and always will. My whole family is there. And important for me to get a native Detroiter like you, uh, because you acted like you just going to be sitting in the audience and Jalen is moderating (laughs) the conversation, (laughs) right? He is is going to be asking me all the questions about the book Mm -hmm. and giving people a feel for some of the subjects that I tackle in it. But um, yeah, I mean, it could end no other place, you know, but, but home and, I'm going to be in Detroit a couple of days. I have a couple of book events. It's the Detroit uh, Public Library event, which is like sort of like the big, big one. And then I have one that'll be a little bit smaller at Mary Grove College. And that I'm doing in conjunction with my alma mater, um, uh, Mumford High School. And so, you know, of course, this is our way of, of paying tribute to the city, giving back to the city. And um, yeah, I mean, I just listen, they lucky if it was up to me, I'd be staying in Detroit like a five day tour. <laughs> okay. No itself. doubt. No doubt. But uh, unfortunately, I only have about two or three days because of course I'm hitting Michigan State while I'm there as well. Absolutely. And before I let you get out of here, and again, I'm so gracious that you took the time. I'm looking forward to hosting at the Detroit Public Library. Publicly, I feel like you and I have so many things things in common we went to rival schools but we don't get a chance to publicly be vulnerable and I've talked a lot about mental health on this show and so I have to ask you like what are some of the tools and methods that you have found help you on your healing journey and what advice do you have for someone who wants to begin breaking generational curses Well, um, one way I think to break it, and I hope this is a takeaway people have after they read Appeal or even as they're reading Appeal, is I think it's important that we talk to our elders about their lives, like really talk to them about it, what their life was like before we came along as either their child or grandchild, nephew, niece, whatever. What was their lives like? What were some of the disappointments, the failures? Like really have open conversations about the times that they lived through. You know, one of the traumas we've experienced as Black people in this country is that a lot of our elders have a hard time talking about what segregation was like for them, what Jim Crow was like for them, because those are very painful incidents. But I think it helps to take the shame off these generational curses, which is a key to me in breaking them. The other thing I would say also is obviously don't be afraid to seek therapy and talk openly about the fact that you're in therapy. But I had to, and still I'm learning, I had to teach myself or try to learn how to be vulnerable. You know, one of the amazing things I think about my marriage is that my husband is very good at expressing how he feels in the moment. Like he's very communicative and it really um, works for our relationship. It's something I'm getting better at. And a lot of times, sometimes I think what happens in relationships is the quality you want and you admire is the one you seek out in a mate. And it helps you to build up maybe your area of weakness where you're weak. And that's not to say this will, this necessarily doesn't have to come in romantic partnerships. I think even in friendships Friendships, that be, yeah, be able to have this, these, these open dialogues um, with your friends so that they're where they're strong at can strengthen you and where you're strong at, you can strengthen them. 
And before I let you get out of here, and again, I appreciate you taking the time. There's a new memoir out right now, Uphill. Make sure you go cop this from Jamel Hill. I have a rapid fire segment called Gone in 60 Seconds. You ready to do this? <laughs> Oof, I am, man. This is this is the pressure. To me, this is where the controversy always yes, happens. Yeah, this, this, <laughs> because the first question is controversial. What is oh, your God. favorite restaurant in Detroit? You are so wrong for this. Okay. My favorite, I'm going to say my favorite, my favorite hood spot in Detroit is Golden Bowl uh, mm. on uh, Six Mile. By my favorite Chinese food spot. I have to go literally Real every egg time. Egg young patties, baby, all baby, day. Egg, I was uh, almond uh, boneless chicken. Like the way we do Chinese food in the D is just unlike anywhere else. So for me, it's Golden Bowl. I love that answer. That was my spot growing up right there on Puritan and Appaline. My spot. You have a YouTube show, and shout to your husband, Ian, fellow Detroit Southwest and prospector, called Conversations on Vacation. So I have to ask, what do you think is the best vacation spot to have a deep conversation Ooh, because we've had a few. I, I think of all the places that we've gone, because you got to kind of sit still with it. I'm going to say Fiji. Like, we went to Fiji, and that was a great place, because, we, you know, you're in Fiji. Uh, you have the city part, and then you have the part where it's just, like, a, it's made of over, over 300 islands. So you're on an nice. island. On the island is all you got, and it's just the resort you're on, on and that's it. And so um, that was one of the first vacations that we took as a couple. And we had a blast there. Incredible. And you're an inspiration to so many. But I have to ask you, in media growing up, who was your inspiration? Uh, also, in equally hard questions. These are not getting easier, by the way, Jalen. <laughs> I, <just> want... <laughs> I just want you uh, to know that. Um, so I would probably say... Uh, for me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it to the sports world because it's it's other people who have been mentors who are yep. not in the sports world, but probably the sports writer whose career I most wanted to emulate was Michael Wilbon. Mm -hmm. I, I read him in college. He was a fantastic columnist for the Washington Post, and his way with language, the simplicity in which he could explain things, and he was such a intrepid reporter. Like I I could read him. And even if I didn't know who wrote it, if he took his byline off, I still would know it was Michael Wilbon. Shout to Wilby, the Yoda. <laughs> I get a chance to work with him on Countdown. He is that dude. And I asked you your favorite books earlier, but I have to also ask, because we're going to make sure we talk about as many books as we can, what are you reading now or what would you highly recommend besides your great memoir that's out <laughs> right now what would you tell somebody to go read besides this and why? Uh, well, currently, um, I'm actually, weirdly enough, during the, during the pandemic, I had actually never read an, or I never listened to an audio book. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to try because I was, you know, we, we were searching for ways to exercise because we went in the gym. So yeah. I would go on long walks uh, around the neighborhood and so I really got into audiobooks. And the audiobook I'm listening to now is Will Smith's um, audiobook, which is quite good. Um, you know, the because uh, he he's an actor, so this is a cheat code. Now, he doesn't have the best audiobook I ever listened to. That's Viola Davis. But he right in there because right. he incorporates music. You know, he's rapping in it. He's singing in it. Like, it is such a dynamic sound experience. So I highly suggest to people that you listen to the audiobook of Will Smith, which of course is done by Will Smith. And last but certainly not least, and we're not here to promote any violence in any way, shape or form, but I have to ask you this. What was your, I wish a ninja would moment <laughs> when Will Smith smacked Chris Rock? You know, did I have, a, I wish, you know, I, I would say this in general, like you said, we're not here to promote violence, but you have to draw, you have to draw boundaries sometimes with people. You know, mm -hmm. I, the one moment that I have been expecting to happen is when one of um, my political detractors try to run up on me because that's going to be a Jalen, I'm a Nisa Bell money moment. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, it has it has yet to happen. And, you know, you, you know how a lot of people get real courageous mm -hmm. about that. 
But um, I've certainly had, I mean, probably the, the last time I came the closest to being in a fight was at Liv in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Me and my girls, it's Memorial Day weekend. All right. And I don't know if anybody has ever been to Memorial Day weekend in Miami. It's a new level. Like that is. Sh- Our that people is shena- be there. We be there. there. We take the city over. We it's there. On 24 new hours. Air shen- freak Nick. New era freak New era. It's 24 hour shenanigans all the time. And one of my girls, it's like four or five of us. And one of my girls had, and she had a hookup. We got a little, we got a table at live, which is not easy to do that weekend, but we got mm-hmm. a comp, you know, we got bottles. We like, we done really come <laughs> up in here. And this was when I was moderately, you know, famous. I was, uh, I, I didn't have his and hers yet, but I was doing first take and around the horn and all those other shows. So, you know, I was, I was outside and the folks was recognizing <laughs> me. I was like, all right, what up? So we have this really, you know, good seating arrangement with the bottles. And these young ladies who we do not know start, sitting on our stuff and we like did they uh, like hold on hold on sis hold on hold on hold on you know what i'm saying like started like and then when we politely politely we wouldn't we weren't trying mm-hmm. to come off super aggressive right. ask them to get up and leave they gave us an attitude i'm like i'm sorry i mean and and look we didn't pay this but that plate where we were seated it was 10 g's Ooh. just for the booth it was 10 mm-hmm. G's for the booth. No doubt. And they really was trying to be on some disrespectful type of stuff. And they gave us lip about it. And we we're like, listen, you can't sit here. I don't care how bad your feet hurt. You should have worn them cheap ass <laughs> shoes. Okay. I don't care. So old girl get up and she got a lot of mouth. And my other girl, they start having a conversation because they didn't immediately disperse. Then they try to do the whole, we just going to lean on y'all booth. Like, no, no, no. Y'all got to go. Like, period. <laughs> Get from round us. <laughs> and they started, you know, having a little too much mouth. And one of my girls stepped to her. I see them two arguing. You know, I've had a few at this point. I know it's surprising. I've had a few. So I, I roll up and I was on some ice cube. Do we have a problem here? Is there a problem here? Is there a problem here? We got a problem. So we get the jaw and all this. And my girl, like, the last person who could fight up in here is you. And I'm like, I'm ready. Like, I'm ready. I'm like, I had no action in a minute. What you going to do? <laughs> And, you know, later on the next day, as we were telling the story and laughing, I was like, y'all know, I'm just too old to fight. And <laughs> I'm too old to fight. And certainly at this age, I'm too rich to fight. So no. No doubt. No <laughs> doubt. And you can't be having nobody punching this gorgeous face. Not at, at all. all. <laughs> Not at all. all. I love and appreciate you. Thank you for all that you have and will continue to do. Make sure you guys go cop uphill right now. It's the great Jamel Hill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jalen. I see you in Detroit. (laughs) Got it.